Think of the 11th of November, and the first thing that probably comes to mind is the signing of the armistice in 1918. However, four years earlier, it was a day on which the tide of war changed. On the 11th of November 1914, the First Battle of Ypres was at its height, and the German advance towards the city seemed unstoppable. The British 1st Infantry Brigade held a position at Nomboshen, with the Scots Guards, Cameron Highlanders and the Black Watch making up the line north of the Menin Road. The Black Watch position centred around the area of Polygon Wood. This was the British Army's last hope to save the city of Ypres. This was not a situation that British commanders had aimed for, and the lead-up to the action at Nomboshen was nothing short of a disaster for the 1st Brigade, and particularly the Black Watch. On the 29th of October, the British front line had been broken at the Gellevelt Crossroads on the Menin Road. This point was held by various battalions, with individual companies of the Black Watch interspersed between them to fill the gaps. Nonetheless, they were stretched thin, and large gaps remained, including over a 100 yards between C Company, 1st Black Watch, and the neighbouring Scots Guards. On the morning of the 29th, the Germans advanced down the Menin Road and over the ground to the north, completely overwhelming B Company of the Black Watch and several companies of the Coldstream Guards. Now able to exploit their breakthrough and get behind the British line, the enemy then turned on C Company of the Black Watch, where the gap in the defences and the weakened Coldstream position left them vulnerable from both flanks. To make matters worse, ammunition was low, and when supplies were brought up, it was marked for practice only, and dated from the Boer War. Captain Axel Campbell Crook, the officer commanding, described what happened. Heavy firing began on the right of the Coldstream line, and very soon extended to our line. On the left of my line, my trench curved round in a semicircle, and then came to a 120-yard space between us and the Scots Guards. At this part of my trench, the Germans made three charges, but they were all repulsed with severe loss to the enemy. We now had to open the boxes of ammunition marked for practice only and issue it. It was maddening. The cartridges burst in the chamber after firing, and it was almost impossible to get the breach open again. The men were cursing and using their feet to kick the breach open. After receiving a message from the Coldstream Guards that they had lost two companies, Crook sent out a party of men to guard the right rear flank in case the enemy tried to get behind them, and sent several messages to the Scots Guards. None of them returned, and the Germans managed to outflank C Company. On getting near the left end of my trench, I saw that there was no one left of my left section, and it was difficult to get along as there were dead and wounded lying in the narrow trench. I turned to go back along to the right, and came face to face with a lot of Germans. I had my notebook and pencil in my hands, and I must admit that I was taken by surprise. They fired at me, and one downed me with the butt end of his rifle, and that was the end of the fight for me. That wasn't the end of Crook's account, however. And he went on to say, Angus McNaughton was with me until the last moment when I went to the left of my line. Then what remained of the line was attacked with the bayonet from the rear. The sections sent out to guard our right rear were overwhelmed without having the chance of even warning us. There was a reason Crook felt that he needed to include this information. Lieutenant Angus McNaughton was a part-time officer in the Special Reserve and had come out to Belgium with the battalion's first reinforcements. The confusion in the disaster on the 29th of October was so great that it led to many conflicting accounts of what had happened to him, and with Crook taken prisoner, there was no one who could be sure. Angus's wife, Hazel, held out hope that he was alive for years, only accepting that he had been killed upon the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. Such episodes characterise the confusion 
and disorganisation which followed the action on the 29th of October. The Black Watch had lost five officers and 250 men, and the other battalions of the 1st Brigade recorded similar figures. Much of the line was retaken in the following days, and the famous counter-attack by the Worcestershire Regiment on October the 31st showed that the BEF could still put up a fight, but the crossroads remained in enemy hands. Weakened in numbers and morale, the Black Watch continued to defend against sporadic attacks, losing another officer and five men in a counter-attack on the 2nd of November. By the 11th, the battalion had taken up its position on the left of the brigade, at the southwest corner of Polygon Wood, with C Company in a strong point to the rear as support. At 6.30am, the heaviest bombardment the British Expeditionary Force had so far experienced began, signalling the beginning of a major enemy assault. As soon as it ended, a division of the Prussian Guard advanced on the 1st Brigade position, and the Black Watch were driven back, and the front line was again broken. Some men, led by 2nd Lieutenant Neil McNeil, stayed behind to slow the enemy advance, and McNeil was last seen fighting on the parapet of his trench before it was overrun. C Company, now under the command of Lieutenant Francis Anderson, was again to bear the brunt of the German assault. Their position was an early version of the strong points which would soon become a feature of trench warfare, and was designed by the Royal Engineers to hold out if the enemy penetrated the front line, having an all-round field of fire and a thick belt of barbed wire surrounding it. The tactic worked, an enemy was forced to split up into small groups in order to avoid the hail of fire coming from the strong point. Even so, enough made it past to overwhelm B Company, who were in reserve in trenches behind the wood, and advanced towards the battalion headquarters at Vierbeek Farm. This farm was in fact home to the headquarters of both the Black Watch and the Cameron Highlanders, and it was soon occupied by the enemy, while the commanding officers of both battalions were still inside. Lieutenant Colonel Stewart and Sergeant Redpath of the Black Watch, along with Lieutenant Colonel McEwen of the Cameron Highlanders, refused to surrender the farm, despite Stewart being wounded in the head. Their resistance was so strong that the Germans gave up the farm and began to shell it with shrapnel. Meanwhile, Captain Gawain Rowan Hamilton and Captain Victor Fortune reorganised the British troops who had been pushed back by the German advance. Rowan Hamilton then tried to reach Colonel Stewart at the farm, but was shot while running across a 60-yard stretch of open ground. Fortune, now the only Black Watch officer left besides Anderson trapped in the strong point, led a counter-attack at 1pm and made some progress. Captain Harold Amory, himself wounded, then brought up two more companies and lost many men from German machine gun fire. However, the German advance was halted. Finally, a combined counter-attack was made by the remnants of the Black Watch, Cameron Highlanders and reinforcements from the Northamptonshire Regiment, and the area around the headquarters and the strong point was retaken. Upon relieving the strong point, it was found that the garrison had taken many casualties and Lieutenant Anderson was severely wounded, having himself accounted for a large number of the enemy. But C Company, by breaking up the German advance and holding out until the retreating troops could regroup, had saved the battalion and the brigade from a defeat like that at the Gellevelt crossroads just days before, and the action at Nomboshen marked the beginning of the end of the First Battle of Ypres. The area near where C Company's strong point once stood is now known as Blackwatch Corner. <laughs>